This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Economics is interesting because it's all of the above. To start with magic, the notion that you can make some change and simply everyone's better off, that is a kind of modern magic that has replaced old style magic. It's an art in the sense that the models are not very exact. It's a science in the sense that occasionally propositions are falsified. There are a few basic things we know. Yeah. And however trivial they may sound, if you don't know them, you're out of luck. So all of the above. I don't think economics will ever be very predictive. It's most useful for helping you ask better questions. Mm. You look at something like game theory. Well, game theory never predicted USA and USSR would have a war, would not have a war. But trying to think through the, the logic of strategic conflict, if you know game theory, it's just a much more interesting discussion. I think we will destroy each other with those weapons. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> Look, it's a very low probability event. So I'm not surprised it hasn't happened yet. I'm yeah. a little surprised it came as close as it did. You know, your general thinking, realizing it might have just been a flock of birds or it wasn't a first strike attack from the USA, we got very lucky on that one. But if you just keep on running the clock on a low probability event, it will happen. And it may not be USA and China, USA and Russia, whatever. You know, it could be the Saudis and Turkey. And it might not be nuclear weapons. It might be some other destruction. Bioweapons. But it simply will happen is my view. And I've argued at best we have seven or 800 years and that's being generous. A worst? How how long we got? Well, maybe it's Asking like a, for a arrival <laughs> process, right? Okay. So tiny probability could yeah. come any time, probably not in your lifetime, but uh, the chance presumably increases the cheaper weapons of mass destruction are. not so negative on human nature. And as an economist, I very much see the gains from cooperation. Yeah. But if you just ask, are there outliers in history? Like, was there a Hitler, for instance? Yes. Obviously. And again, you let the clock tick. Another Hitler with nuclear weapons doesn't per se care about his own destruction. It will happen. So your sense is fundamentally people are good, but A trembling hand happen. equilibrium is what we would call it. Trembling hand equilibrium? That the basic logic is for cooperation, which is mostly what we've seen, even between enemies. But every now and then, someone does something crazy, and you don't know how to react to it. And you can't always beat Hitler. Sometimes Hitler drags you down. I agree it's very unlikely. In that sense, I accept the argument. But that's why you need to let the clock tick. It's also the best argument for bureaucracy. Yeah. To negotiate a bureaucracy, it actually selects against pure evil because yeah. you need to build alliances. So bureaucracy in that regard is great, right? It keeps out the worst apples. But look, put it this way. Could you imagine 35 years from now, the Osama bin Laden of the future has nukes or very bad bioweapons? It seems to me you can. Yeah. And Osama was pretty evil. And actually, even he failed, right? But nonetheless, that's what the seven or 800 years is there for. I mean, let me ask you a question. Let's say you could, as an act of will, by spending a million dollars, obliterate any city on earth and everyone in it dies and you'll get caught uh, and you'll be sentenced to death, but you can make it happen just by willing it. How many months does it take before that happens? When I say destroy the world, there's a trick in there. I don't think literally every human will die, but it would set back civilization by an extraordinary degree. It's then just hard to predict what comes next. Yeah. But a catastrophe where everyone dies, that probably has to be something more like an asteroid or supernova. And those are purely exogenous for the time being, at least. Dream. The American dream is mostly still there. If you look at which groups are the highest earners, it is individuals from India and individuals from Iran, which is a fairly new development. Mm. Great for them, not necessarily easy. Both you could call 
persons of color may have faced discrimination, also on the grounds of religion, uh, yet they've done it. That's amazing. It says great things about America. Now, if you look at native-born Americans, the story's trickier. People think intergenerational mobility has declined a lot recently, but it has not for native-born Americans. Uh, for about, I think, 40 years, it's been fairly constant, which is sort of good, but compared to much earlier times, it was much higher in the past. I'm not sure we can replicate that because, look, go to the beginning of the 20th century, very few Americans finish high school uh, or even have much wealth. There's not much credentialism. There aren't that many credentials. So there's more upward mobility across the generations than today. And it's a good thing that we had it. I'm not sure we should blame the modern world for not being able to reproduce that. But look, the general issue of who gets into Harvard or Cornell? Is there an injustice? Should we fix that? Is there too little opportunity for the bottom, say, half of Americans? Absolutely. It's a disgrace how this country has evolved in that way. And in that sense, the American dream is clearly ailing. But it has had problems from the beginning for blacks, for women, for many other groups. Wow. To have it, we each have podcasts, right, in mm -hmm. English. The value of joining that American English language network is much higher today than it was 30 years ago, mostly mm -hmm. because of the internet. So that makes immigration returns themselves skewed. So going to the US, Canada, or the UK, I think has become much more valuable in relative terms than say going to France, which is still a pretty well off, very nice country. <sighs> if you had gone to France, your chance of having a globally known podcast would be much smaller. There's something above and beyond language in the United States. It's a sense of entertainment really mattering, how to connect with your audience, being direct and getting to the point, uh, how humor is integrated even with science. Yeah. That is pretty strongly represented here, much more, say, than on the European continent. Mm. Britain has its own version of this, which it does very well. And not surprisingly, they're hugely influential in music, comedy, the most of the other areas you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Canada, yes, but their best talent tends to come here. But you could say it's like a broader North American thing and mm -hmm. give them their fair share of credit. Well, you can become a celebrity scientist if you want to. It may or may not be best for science. And we have Spock from Star Trek, who is still a big deal. But look at it this way. <laughs> Which country is most comfortable with inegalitarian rewards yeah. for scientists, whether it's fame or money? And I still think it's here. Some of that's just the tax rate. Some of it is a lot of America is set up for rich people to live really well. And again, that's going to attract a lot of top talent. Yeah. And you ask like the two best vaccines. I know the Pfizer vaccine is mm -hmm. sort of from Germany, sort of from Turkey, but it's nonetheless being distributed through the United States, Moderna. An Ar Armen ethnic Armenian immigrant through Lebanon, first to Canada, then down here to Boston, Cambridge area. Those are incredible vaccines, and U.S. nailed it. People use the word capitalism in, in so many different ways. What is capitalism? The literal meaning is private ownership of capital goods, which I favor in most areas. But no, I don't think the private sector should own our F-16s or military assets. Government-owned water utilities seem to work as well as privately owned water utilities. But with all those qualifications put to the side, business, for the most part, innovates better than government. It is oriented toward consumer services. The biggest businesses tend to pay the highest wages. Business is great at getting things done. USA is fundamentally a nation of business, and that makes us a nation of opportunity. So I am indeed mostly a fan, <laughs> subject to numerous caveats. Again, capitalism takes a different form in each country. I would say in the United States, our weird blend of whatever you want to call it has had an enduring racial problem from the beginning has been a force of taking away land from Native Americans and oppressing them pretty much from the beginning. Um, it has done very well by immigrants for the most part. 
uh, we revel in Schumpeterian crea creative destruction more, so we don't just prop up national champions forever. And there is a precariousness to life for some people here that is less so, say, in Germany or the Netherlands. We have weaker communities in some regards than, say, Northwestern Europe often would. Mm. That has pluses and minuses. I think it makes us more creative. It's a better country in which to be a weirdo than, say, Germany or Denmark. But there is truly, whether from the government or from your private community, there is less social security in some fundamental sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And here that is either acceptable or even admired mm -hmm. or to be a loner. And since so many people are outsiders and that we're all immigrants is selecting for people who left something behind, were yeah. willing to leave behind their families, were willing to undergo a certain brutality of switch in their lives, makes us a nation of weirdos. And weirdos are creative. Yeah. And Denmark is not a nation of weirdos. It's a wonderful place you know, great for them. Ideally, you want part of the world to be full of weirdos and innovating and the other part of the world to be a little kind of chicken shit, risk averse mm -hmm. and enjoy the benefits of the it. innovation and to give people these smooth lives and six weeks off and free ride. And everyone's like, oh, American way versus European way, but basically they're compliments. So the Russians, I think, fit in very well here. Because the ones who come are weirdos. And there's a yeah. very different Russian weirdo tradition, like yeah. Alyosha, right yeah. in Brothers Karamazov, yeah. or Perelman, the mathematician. They're weirdos. And they have their own different kind of status in Soviet Union, Russia, wherever. And when Russians come to America, they stay pretty Russian. But it seems to me a week later, they've somehow adjusted. Yeah. And the ways in which they might want to be like grumpier. Then yeah. Americans not smile, think the yeah. people who smile are idiots. Yeah. Like they can do that. No one takes that away from them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Look, prizes are corrupting. After scientists win Nobel Prizes, they tend to become less productive. <laughs> now, statistically, it's hard to sort out the different effects. There's regression toward the mean. Does yeah. the prize make you too busy? It's a little tricky, but there's not enough seen... Nobel Prizes either to, to, to get gather enough data. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's I've known a lot of Nobel Prize winners, and it is my sense they become less productive. They repeat more of their older messages, which may be highly socially valuable. But if someone wants to turn their back on that and keep on working, which I assume is what he's doing, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, we should respect that. <laughs> it's like he wins a bigger prize, right? Our yeah. extreme respect. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh <laughs> really matters is how good your legal framework is. So competition within nature, you know, for food leads to bloody conflict all the time. The animal world is quite unpleasant to say the least. If you have something like the rule of law and clearly defined property rights, which are within reason justly allocated, uh, competition probably is going to work very well. But it's not an unalloyed good thing at all. It can be highly destructive. Military competition, right? which actually is itself sometimes good, but it's not good per se. Well, the fight for territory, most of all, right? So violence, anything that involves like actual physical violence. Right, and it's not that I think the current borders are just. I mean, go talk to Hungarians, Romanians, you know, Serbians, Bosnians, they'll talk your ear off. And some of them are probably right. But at the end of the day, we have some kind of international order and I would rather we more or less stick with it. If Catalonians want to leave, they keep up with it, you know, let them go. But I think in this country, healthcare should be much more competitive. So you go to hospitals, doctors, they don't treat you like a customer. Uh, they treat you like an idiot or like a child or yeah. someone with third party payment. And it's a pretty humiliating experience often. Yeah. think the term pure free market's well-defined because you need a legal order. The legal order has to make decisions on like what is intellectual property mm -hmm. more important than ever. There's no benchmark that like represents the pure free market way of doing things. Mm -hmm. uh, what will penalties be? How much do we put into law enforcement? No simple answers, but just saying free market 
doesn't pin down what you're going to do on those all important questions. It generates a lot of them, right? Through private norms, through trade associations. International trade is mostly done uh, privately mm -hmm. and by norms. So it's certainly possible. But at the end of the day, I think you need governments to draw very clear lines to prevent it from turning into mafia-run systems. Well, I wouldn't press a button to say get rid of our current constitution, which I view as pretty good and quite wise. But I think the deeper point is that all societies are in some regards anarchistic. Yes. And we should take the anarchists seriously. So globally, there's a kind of anarchy uh, across borders, even within federalistic systems, they're typically complex. There's not a clear transitivity necessarily of who has the final say over what. Uh, just the state vis-a-vis -vis its people. There's not per se a final arbitrator in that regard. So you want a good anarchy rather than a bad anarchy. You want to squish your anarchy into the right corners. And I don't think there's a theoretical answer how to do it. But you start with a country, like, is it working well enough now? This country, you'd say mostly, you'd certainly want to make a lot of improvements. And that's why I don't want to press that get rid of the Constitution button. But to just dump on the anarchists is to miss the point. You always try to learn yeah. from any opinion, you know, and what in it is true. Ayn Rand was a big influence on me growing up. The book that really mattered for me was Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Hmm. The notion that wealth creates opportunity and good lives and wealth is something we ought to valorize and give very high status. It's one of her key ideas. I think it's completely correct. I think she has the most profound and articulate statement of that idea. That said, as a philosopher, I disagree with her on most things. And I did, even like as a boy when I was reading her. I read Plato before Ayn Rand. And in a Socratic dialogue, there's all these different points of view being thrown around. Yeah. And who, whomever it is you agree with, you understand the wisdom is in the coming together of the different points of view. Yeah. And she doesn't have that. So altruism can be wonderful in my view. Humans are not actually that rational. Self-interest is often poorly defined. To pound the table and say existence exists, I wouldn't say I disagree, but I'm not sure that it's a very meaningful statement. I think the secret to Ayn Rand is that she was Russian. I'd love to have her on my podcast if she were still alive. I'd only ask her about Russia, which she mostly never talked about after writing We the Living. And she is much more Russian than she seems at first, even like purging people from the objectivist circles. It's like how Russians, especially female Russians, so often purge their friends. It's weird, all the parallels. <laughs> Traumas she suffered there, yeah. what she really likes in the music and literature and why. Music and literature, huh? And getting deeply into that, her view of relations between the sexes and Russia, how it differs from America, why she still carries through the old Russian vision in her fiction, yeah. this extreme sexual dimorphism, but with also very strong women. Yeah. To me is a uniquely, at least Eastern European uh, vision, mostly Russian, I would say. Yeah. And that's in her. That's her actual real philosophy, not this table-bounding existence yeah. exists. And that's not talked about enough. Yeah. She's a Russian philosopher. Yeah. Like she, or Soviet, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Like in my view, Boswell's Life of Johnson, 18th mm. century British biography. It's in essence a co-authored work, Boswell and Johnson. It's one of the greatest philosophy books ever, though it is commonly regarded as a biography. John Stuart Mill, who in a sense was co-authoring with Harriet Taylor, a better philosopher than is realized, though he's rated very, very highly. Plato slash Socrates, a lot of the greatest works are in a kind of dialogue form. Goethe's Faust would be another example. It's very much a dialogue. And yes, it's drama, but it's also philosophy. Shakespeare, maybe the wisest thinker of them all. <laughs> You look at, say, the pandemic, which has been a catastrophic event, right, for, for many reasons. But who is it that saved us? So Amazon has done remarkably well. They upped their delivery game more or less overnight with very few hitches. I've ordered hundreds of Amazon packages, direct delivery food, 
whether it's DoorDash or Uber Eats or using, you know, Whole Foods through Amazon shipping. Again, it's gone remarkably well. Switching over our entire higher educational system, basically within two weeks to Zoom. Mm -hmm. Zoom did it. I mean, I've had a Zoom outage, but their performance rate has been remarkably high. So if you just look at resources, competence, incentives, who's been the star performers, the NBA even, just canceling the season as early as they did, sending a message like, hey, people, this is real, and then pulling off the bubble with not a single found case of COVID and having all the testing set up in advance. Can Big business has done very well lately and throughout the broader course of American history, in my view, has mostly been a hero. <laughs> I don't know if we can fix it. I think we are beings of high neuroticism for the most part <laughs> yeah. as a personality trait. Not everyone, but yeah. most people. And as a compliment to that, if someone says 10 nice things about you and one insult, you're more bothered by the insult than you're pleased yeah. by the nice things, yeah. especially if the insult is somewhat true. Yeah. So you have these media, these vehicles, Twitter is one you mentioned, where there's all kinds of messages going back and forth. And you're really bugged by the messages you don't like. Most people are neurotic to begin with. It's not only taken out on big business, to be clear. So Congress catches a lot of grief and yeah. some of it they deserve, yes. Uh, religion is not attacked the same way, but religiosity is declining. If you poll people, the military still polls quite well, but people are very disillusioned with many things. And the Martin Gurry thesis that because of the internet, you just see more of things and the more you see of something, whether it's good, bad, or in between, the more you will find to complain about, I suspect, is the fundamental mechanism here. I mean, look at Clubhouse, right? It's, yes. To me, it's a great service, may or may not be like my thing, but gives people this opportunity. No one makes you go on it. And all these media articles like, oh, is Clubhouse going to wreck things? You know, Are they going to break things? New York Times is complaining. Of course, it's their competitor as well. Yeah. I'm like, give these people a chance, like talk it up. You may or may not like it. Like, let's praise the people who are getting something done. Very Ayn Randian point. I've greatly enjoyed what I've done, but I'm not sure it's for me in the long run for two reasons. Mm -hmm. First, if you compare it to doing a podcast, podcasting has greater reach than Clubhouse. So I would rather put time yes. into my podcast. But then also my like core asset, so to speak, is I'm a very fast reader. So audio per se is not necessarily to my advantage. I don't mm. speak or listen faster than other people. In fact, I'm a slower listener because I like 1.0, not 1.5x. So I should spend less time on audio and more time reading and writing. Maybe what it's perfect for is the tribute. So they had an episode recently that I didn't hear, but I heard it was wonderful. It was anecdotes about Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. That you can't do one-to-one, -one, right? And you don't want control. You want different people appearing and stepping up and saying their bit. Yeah. And Clubhouse is 110% perfect for that. The tribute. But they'll stay lonely, in my opinion. You think so? I do. So it is a pandemic thing, but I think it will persist. And the idea of wanting to be connected to more of the world, Clubhouse will still offer that. And all the mental health issues out there, a lot of people have broken ties and they will still be lonely post-vaccines. Are touring bots going to outcompete Clubhouse? Like why not pro sort of program your own session? You'll just talk into your device and say, here's the kind of conversation I want. And it will create the characters for you. And it may not be as good as Elon and Vladimir Putin, but it will be better than ordinary Clubhouse. This is related to immigration and the American dream. In what way? The Just... people who have come to this country, however weird and different they may be, they or their ancestors at some point probably have shared this thing. Right? U.S. is not going to split up. It may get more screwed up as a country, <laughs> but Texas and California are not going to break off. Yeah. I mean, they're big enough where they could do it, but it's just never going to happen. I've long been in agreement with Eric Peter Thiel 
uh, Robert Gordon and others, that growth has slowed down. I argued that in my book, The Great Stagnation, uh, appropriately titled. But the last two years, I've become much more optimistic. I've seen a lot of breakthroughs in green energy and battery technology. mRNA vaccines in medicine is a big deal already. It will repair our GDP and save millions of lives around the world. Uh, there's an anti-malaria vaccine that's now in stage three trial. It probably works. CRISPR to defeat sickle cell anemia. Just space, area after area after area, there's suddenly the surge of breakthroughs. I would say many of them rooted in superior computation and ultimately Moore's law and access to those computational abilities. So I'm much more optimistic than, say, the last time I spoke to Eric. <laughs> I don't know. He, he moves all the time in his views. I don't know where he's at now. You're very close to it in your own work. I don't yes. have to tell you that. The work you're doing would not have been possible not very long ago. But the question is, how much does that work enable continued growth for decades to come? That's for all their problems, some version of driverless vehicles will be a thing. I'm not sure when. You know much better than I do. Maybe only partially, but that too will be a big deal. was a New York Times symposium in April, which is not long ago. And they asked the so-called experts, when are we going to get vaccines? And the most optimistic answer was in four years. Yeah. And obviously we beat that by a long mile. So I think people still haven't woken up. You mentioned yeah. my tiny drop of optimism, but it's a big drop of <laughs> optimism. Is it, is it a waterfall yet? I mean, is it, is it just... <laughs> well, here's my pessimism. Whenever there are major new technologies, they also tend to be used for violence, directly or indirectly. Yeah, yeah. Radio, Hitler, not that he hit people over the head with radios, but it enabled the rise of various dictators. Yeah. So the new technologies now, whatever exactly they may be, they're going to cause a lot of trouble. Yeah. And that's my pessimism, not that I think they're all going to slow to a trickle. When was the stagnation book? 2011. 2011. Yes. It was the first of the stagnation books, in fact. <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but even then, I said, this is temporary. And I was predicting it would be gone in about 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that's exactly the right prediction, like 2030, but I think we're actually going to beat that. Well, communism is like capitalism. The words mean many things to different people. Yes. You could argue my life as a tenured professor comes closer to communism <laughs> than anything <laughs> the human race has seen. And I would argue it works pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> but look, if you mean the Soviet Union, it devolved pretty quickly to a kind of decentralized set of incentives that were destructive rather than value maximizing. It wasn't even central planning, much mm -hmm. less communism. So Paul Craig Roberts and Polanyi were correct in their descriptions of the Soviet system. Think of it as weird mixes of barter and malfunctioning incentives and being very good at a whole bunch of things. But in terms of progress, innovation, and consumer goods, it really being quite a failure. Uh, and now I wouldn't call that communism, but that's what I think of the system the Soviets had. And it required an ever increasing pile of lies that both alienated people, but created an elite that by the end of the thing no longer believed in the system itself, mm -hmm. or even thought they were doing better by being crooks than by just say moving to Switzerland and being an upper middle class individual. Like you would have a higher standard of living by Gorbachev's time, not Gorbachev, but if you're number 30 in the hierarchy, you're mm -hmm. better off as a middle class person in Switzerland. And that of course did not prove sustainable. <laughs> You can't use normal profit and loss and price incentives. So you get all prices or most prices set too low, right? Shortages everywhere. People trade favors. You have this culture of bartered bribes, sexual favors, or you know, family friends. And yeah. you get more and more of that. And you, over time, lose more and more of the information and the prices and quantities and practices and norms you had. And that sort of slowly decays. And then by the end, no one is believing in it. That would be my take, but again, you're you're the expert here. Russia Everything is interesting. I mean, here, here would be <laughs> part of my take. As you know, the, the Russian economy, starting, what, 1999, 2000, 
has really quite a few years of super excellent growth. And Putin is still riding on that. It mm. more or less coincides with his rise as the truly focal figure on the scene. Uh, since then, pretty recently, they've had a bunch of years of negative 4 to 5% growth in a row, which is terrible. The economy is way too dependent on fossil fuels. But the structural problem is this. You need a concordance across economic power, social power, political power. They don't have to be allocated identically, but they have to be allocated consistently. And the Russian system under Putin from almost the beginning has never been able to have that, that ultimately his incentives are to steer the system where the economic power is in a small number of hands in a non-diversified way. The system won't deliver sustainable gains in living standards anymore, ever, the way it's set up now, that with Fossil fuel prices go up. They'll have some good years for sure. Uh, and that is really quite structural, what has gone wrong. And then on top of that, you can have an opinion of Putin, but you've got to start with those structural problems. And that's why it's just not going to work. But he had all those good years in the beginning. So the number of Russians, say, who live here or in Russia, who love Putin and it's sincere, they're not just afraid of being you know, dragged away. Like that's a real phenomenon. Uh, a lot of that would go away if the press were freer, I think. Yes. Well, Singapore realizes this. Anyone discussed by the press, no matter who they are, people in Singapore have done a great job. Yes. Uh, but if you're discussed by the press, you don't look good. Tech company executives are learning this, right? It's just like a rule. So in that sense, I think the rating is artificially high, but I don't by any means think it's all insincere. But that high popularity I view as bearish for Russia. Mm. I would feel better about the country if people were more pissed off at him. It's all the same thing. So a history of hostility to commerce, which of course the old USSR is gone, but a lot of the attitudes remain, a lot of the corruption remains. You have this legacy distribution of wealth from the auctioning off of the assets, which is not conducive to some kind of broadly egalitarian democracy. And so you have these small number of PowerPoints yeah. that try to control information and wealth and not really so keen to encourage the others who ultimately would pull the balance of political power away from the very wealthy and from Putin. And they support that culture and the return of interest in like Orthodox Church and all that. It's all part of the same piece, I think. Because the old Orthodox Church is not that pro-commerce, you'd have to say, but it's traditionalist, it's pro-family, those are safer ideas. And then there's such a great safety valve, the most ambitious, smartest people, like they probably will learn English. They sort of can look like they belong in all sorts of other countries, they can show up and blend in. Super talented, they've probably had an excellent education, especially if they're from one of the two major cities, but even if not so, even from Siberia, and they go off they leave. They're not a source of opposition. And that keeps the whole thing up and running for another generation. It's amazing what China has done. But I would say, to put it in perspective, if you compare them to Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, they've still done much worse. Hmm. Not even close. Yes, And that's both living standards or, I hesitate to cite democracy as an unalloyed good in and of itself, but there's more freedom in all those other places yes. by a lot. So China has all these problems of history, but they've managed, as actually the Soviets did in the middle of the 20th century, one of the two great mass migrations from the countryside to cities, which boosts productivity enormously and will sustain totalitarian systems. But they moved from a totalitarian system to an oligarchy mm -hmm. where the CCP is actually, at least for a while, hey, have been really good at governing, have made a lot of very good decisions. You have to admit that. I don't know how long that streak will continue with one person so much now holding authority in a more extreme manner. The selection pressures for the next generation of high-level CCP members mm -hmm. probably become much worse. You have this general problem of the state-owned enterprise is losing relative productivity compared mm. to the private sector. Well, we're going to kind of hold Jack Ma on this island and he can only issue like weird hello statements. 
it kind of smells bad to me. I don't feel that it's about to crash. Uh, but, but I don't see them supplanting America as like the world's number one country. I think they will muddle through and have very serious problems. But there's enough talent there, they will muddle through. So keep in mind, the current version of the Chinese Communist Party post Mao dismantled what was called the Iron Rice Bowl. So it took apart the healthcare protections, a lot of the welfare system, a lot of the guaranteed jobs. So the economic rise of China coincided with the weakening of welfare. I'm not saying that's causal per se, but people th think of China as having a government that takes care of everyone. It's very far from the truth. Mm. And by a lot of metrics, I don't mean control over people's lives. I don't mean speech, but by a lot of metrics, economically, we have a lot more government than they do. Mm. So what one means here by like government, private control, I don't think you can just add up the numbers and get a simple answer. They've been fantastic at building infrastructure in cities in ways that will attract people from the countryside. And furthermore, they more or less enforce a meritocracy in this sense. Like if you're a kid of a rich guy, you'll get unfair privilege. Mm -hmm. And that's unfair, but systems can afford that. If you are smart and from the countryside and your parents have nothing, mm -hmm. you will be elevated and sent to a very good school, graduate school, because of the exam system. And they do that and they mean that very consistently. It's like the Soviets had a version of that, like for yes. chess and romantic piano, <laughs> not for everything, but where they had it, like, yeah. again, they were tremendous, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and oh, Chinese okay. have it in so many areas, a genuine meritocracy in this one way. That moves people from the rural to the big city, and that's, that's, all, that's a big boost of productivity for some amount of time. And when they get there, they're taken seriously. Jack Ma was riding a bicycle, teaching English in his late 20s. Mm -hmm. He was a poor guy. The one version of UBI that makes the most sense to me is the Mitt Romney version, UBI for kids. Uh -huh. Like kids are vulnerable. If their parents screw up, you shouldn't blame the kid or make the kid suffer. I believe in something like UBI for kids, maybe just cash. Uh, but if you don't have kids, even with AI, my sense is, at least in the world we know, you should be able to find a way to adjust. You might have to move, you know, to North Dakota to, to work, uh, you know, next to fracking, say. Uh, but look, before the pandemic, the two most robot intensive societies, Japan and the U.S., U.S. at least for manufacturing, uh, were at full employment. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's some far off day where there's literally no work. John Lennon and imagine it's piped, you know, everywhere. And then we might revisit the question. Yeah. But for but, now, we, you know, we had rising wages uh, in the Trump years and full employment. So I don't. You see don't see automation as a threat that fundamentally like shakes our society. It's a threat in the following sense. The new technologies are harder to work with for many people. Yeah. And that's a social problem. But I'm not sure a universal yeah. basic income is the right answer to that very real problem. And your earlier point about loneliness being this fundamental human problem, which yes. I would agree with strongly, UBI, if it's at a high level, will make that worse. I mean, say UBI were higher enough, you could just sit at home. Uh, people are not going to be happy. They don't actually want that. Yeah. And we've relearned that in the pandemic. A lot of the great creators did not have huge cushions, whether it's right. Mozart or James Brown or the great painters in history, yeah. they, they had to work pretty hard. And if you look at heirs to great fortunes, maybe I'm forgetting someone, but it's hard to think of any who have creatively been important as novelists or they might have continued to run the family business. Yeah. But, you know, Van Gogh was not heiress not heir to a great family fortune. That's one of them, but here's at least two others. <laughs> but I would stress Eric is always evolving. So I'm just talking about a time slice, Eric, right? I don't know where he's at right now. Yeah. Like I heard him on Clubhouse three nights ago, but that was three nights ago. Yeah. <laughs> but I think he's far too pessimistic about the impact of immigration on U.S. science. 
Mm. He thinks it has displaced U.S. scientists, which I think that is partly true. I just think we've gotten better talent. I'm like, bring it on, double down. Mm. And look at Carrico, you know, who basically came up with mRNA vaccines. She was from Hungary and uh, was ridiculed and mocked. She couldn't get her papers published. She stuck at it. Uh, an American might not have been so stubborn because we have these cushions. So Eric is all worried, you know, like mathematicians coming in, they're discouraging native U.S. citizens from doing math. I'm like, yeah. bring in the best people. If we all end up in other avocations, absolutely fine by me. Here's another view I have. I call it open borders for Belarus. <laughs> <laughs> now, Russia is a big country. I would gladly like increase the Russian quota yeah. by 3x, 4x, 5x. Like, I, not 20%, but a big boost. But Belarus, <laughs> small country. Yeah. Like, why can't... And yeah. they're poor. Yeah. And they have decent education. And a lot of talent there. Why yeah. can't we just open the door Yeah, and convert a Belarus passport to a green card? Open borders for Belarus. It's my new campaign <laughs> slogan. <laughs> are you running for president in 2024? <laughs> well, write-ins are welcome. But... Okay. <laughs> uh, what's, the, what's the second thing you disagree with, Eric? Uh, trade, again, I'm not sure where he's at now, but he is suspicious of trade in a way that I am not. Mm -hmm. I do understand what's called the China shock has been a big problem for the U.S. middle class. I fully accept that. I think most of that is behind us. National security issues aside, I think free trade is very much a good thing. Eric, I'm not sure he'll say it's not a good thing, but he won't say it is a good thing. And I know he's kind of, uh, it's like, Eric, free trade. But look, on things like vaccines, I don't believe in free trade. Why? You want vaccine production in your own country. Look at the EU. Mm -hmm. They have enough money. No one will send them vaccines. What's different about vaccines? Is it, there's some things you want to prioritize the citizenry on. And you could argue it would be cheaper to produce all U.S. manufactured vaccines in India. Mm -hmm. They have the technologies uh, obviously lower wages. But look, there's talk in India right now of cutting off the export of vaccines. If you outsource your vaccine production, you're not sure the other country will respect the norm of free trade. So you need to keep some vaccine production in your country. It's an exception to free trade, not to the logic. Uh, a bunch of things the Navy uses. You can't buy those components from China. Like mm -hmm. That's insane. But look, it would be cheaper to do so right? No one knows what money is. Probably no one ever knew. Go back to medieval times, bills of exchange. Were they money? Maybe it's just a semantic debate. Gold, silver, what about copper coins? What about metals that were considered legal tender, but not always circulating? Yeah. What about credit? So being confused about moneyness is the natural state of affairs for human beings. And if there's more of that, I'd say that's probably a good thing. Now, crypto, per se, I think Bitcoin has taken over a lot of the space held by gold. Mm -hmm. That, to me, seems sustainable. Uh, I'm not short Bitcoin. I don't have some view that the price has to be different than the current price, but I know it changes every moment. Uh, I am deeply uncertain about the less of crypto, which seems connected to ultimate visions of using it for transactions mm -hmm. in ways where I'm not sure whether it be, you know, prediction markets or DeFi. I'm not sure the retail demand really is there once it is regulated like everything else is. I would say I'm 40, 60 optimistic on those forms of crypto. That is, I think it's somewhat more likely they fail than succeed, but I take them very seriously. <laughs> I don't think we have a good theory of the value of Bitcoin. If people decide it's worth a million dollars, it's worth a million dollars. But isn't that money? Like you said, isn't the ultimate state of money confusion, <laughs> however beautifully you put it? It's like valuing an Andy Warhol painting. So when Warhol started off, probably those things had no value, yeah. the sketches, early sketches of shoes. Uh, now a good Warhol could be worth over 50 million. Yeah, That's an incredible rate of price appreciation. Bitcoin is seeing a similar trajectory I don't pretend to know where it will stop, but it's about trying to figure out well, what do people think of Andy Warhol? He could be out of fashion in a century. 
Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, but you don't think about Warhols as money. They perform some money-like functions. You can even use them as collateral mm -hmm. for like deals between gangs. But they're not basically money, nor is Bitcoin. And the transactions velocity of Bitcoin, I would think, is likely to fall, if anything. Bitcoin, no. Now, you know, Ether has some chance at that. I would bet against it, but I wouldn't give you a definitive no. And you would Bitcoin put is too costly. It, it may be fine to hold it like gold, but gold is also costly. Uh, you have smart people trying to make, say, Ether much more effective as a currency than Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly a decent chance they will succeed. I think of it as like baseball cards. So right now, every baseball player has a baseball card. Mm -hmm. And the players who are stars, their cards can end up worth a fair amount of money. Yeah, And that's stable. We've had it for many decades. Uh, it, sort of the player defines the card. They sign a contract with Tops or whatever company. Now, could you imagine celebrities, baseball players, LeBron James, having their own currencies instead of cards? Absolutely. And you're somewhat seeing that right now, as you mentioned, artists with these unique works on the blockchain. But I'm not sure those are macroeconomically important. If it's just a new class of collectibles that people have fun with, again, I say bring it on. But whether there are use cases beyond that that challenge fiat monies, which actually work very well, yeah. Yesterday, I sent money to a, a family in Ethiopia that I helped support. In less than 24 hours, they got that money. Digitally. Yes. No, so not I, digitally. Through my bank, my uh, primitive no, I, dinosaur bank, BB&T, Mid-Atlantic Bank, headquartered in North Carolina, you know, chartered by the Fed, regulated by the FDAC and the OCC. Now, you could say, well, the exchange rate was not so great. Uh I don't see crypto as close to beating that once you take into account all of the last mile problems. Fiat currency works really well. People are not sitting around bitching about it. And when you yeah. talk to crypto people, the number who have to postulate some out of the blue hyperinflation, where there's no evidence for that whatsoever, that's to me is a sign they're not thinking clearly about how hard they have to work to outcompete fiat currency. <laughs> And the Biden people are going to regulate crypto and they're regulate. going to do it soon. So something like DeFi, I fully get why that is cheaper or for some can be cheaper than other ways of conducting financial intermediation. But some of that is regulatory arbitrage. It will not be allowed to go on forever, for better or worse. Uh, I would rather see it given greater tolerance. And, but the point is, banking lobby is strong. The government will only let it run so far. There'll be capital requirements, reporting requirements imposed, and it will lose a lot of those advantages. If you tell a group of people and coordinate them through the internet, we're going to play a fun game. It might cost you money, but you're going to make the headlines, and there's a chance you'll screw over some billionaires and hedge funds. Enough people will play that game. Yes. So that game might continue, but I don't think it's of macroeconomic importance. Mm. And the price of those stocks in the medium term, will end up wherever it ought to be. Just Think of it as a new brand of esports, maybe more fun <laughs> than the old brand, <laughs> uh, which is fine, right? It's like push the anarchy into the corners where you want it. It doesn't bother me, but I think people are seeing it as more fundamental than it is. It's a new esport, yeah. more fun for many, but more expensive than the old esports. <laughs> Like chess is a new esport, yeah. super cheap, not as fun as like, you know, sending hedge funds to their doom, but like, <laughs> what would you expect? Oh. That chaos is somewhat real, to be clear. Yes. But it will matter through other channels, not through manipulating, you know, GameStop or yeah. AMC. So you're seeing the real macro phenomenon. When people see a real macro phenomenon, they tend to make every micro story fit the narrative. Mm. And this micro story, like it fits the narrative, but it doesn't mean its importance fits the narrative. That's how I would kind of dissect the mistake I think people are making. Uh, do, do you, within the macro phenomena <laughs> that are there, do you mean? Everyone's weird now. The internet, 
either allows us to be weirder or makes us weirder. I'm not sure what's the right way to put it. Maybe a mix of both. Like, say we're weird and somewhat neurotic to begin with, but the only messages we get are Dwight D. Eisenhower and I Love Lucy and Network TV. Like, that's going to keep us within certain bounds. Yeah. In good and bad ways. That's obviously totally gone. And the internet, you can connect to not just QAnon, but all sorts of things. Many yeah. of them just fantastic, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in good and bad ways, it makes us weirder. So that maybe is troubling, right? Like if someone's worried about that, I would at least say they should give it deep, serious thought. And then it has a whole lot of ebbs and flows, micro realizations of the weirdness that don't actually matter. So like chess players today, they play a lot more weird openings than they did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Like it reflects the same thing because you can research any weird opening on the internet, but like, does that matter? Mm -hmm. Probably not. So a lot of the things we see are just like the weird chess openings. And to figure out which are like the weird chess openings and which are fundamental to the new and growing weirdness, like that's what a hedge fund investor type should be trying to do. Mm -hmm. I just think no one knows yet. It's like this itself, this fun, weird guessing game, which we're partly engaging in right now. It's another area where Eric and I disagree. As I interpret him, he thinks academia is totally bankrupt. Yeah. And I think it's only partially bankrupt. <laughs> How do we fix it? Because I'm, I'm with you. I'm, opti I'm bullish on academia. You need up and coming schools that end up better than where they started off. And MIT was once one of them. Yes. Now they're not in every area. In some areas, they have become the problem. Yep. You Chicago, you wouldn't call it up and coming, but it's still different. And that's great. Let's hope they manage to keep it that way. Uh, the biggest problem to me is the rank absurd conformism at kind of second tier schools, maybe in the top 40, but not in the top dozen, that are just trying to be like a junior MIT, mm -hmm. but it's mediocre and copycat. And they're the most dogmatic enforcers of weirdness that like Harvard is more open than those second tier schools. Oh, and those second tier schools are pretty good typically, right? Yeah. But the, the mediocrity is enforced there. Correct. Very yeah. strictly. And the homogenization pressures, Cl try, you know, climb the rankings by another three places yeah. and be a little closer to MIT, though you'll never touch them. Yeah. That to me is very harmful. And you'd rather they be more like Chicago, more like Caltech or the elder Caltech all the more, like pick some model, be weird in it. You might fail. That's socially better. As you look at MIT's Broad Institute, right? Yes, in biomedical, right. it's been a huge hit. Yeah. I'm not privy to their internal doings, but I suspect yeah. they support weird more than the formal departments do at the junior level. It's not true that you don't know anything about the humanities. You're doing the humanities right now. Well, We're talking about people. There are no numbers put on a blackboard, right? Yeah. There's no hypothesis testing per se. No. Yeah. That's you right. have however many subscribers to your podcast, yeah. all listening to you on the humanities. Every, no, but, whatever your frequency is. Uh, the humanities have innovated through podcasts, including yours and mine. Yeah. And they're alive and well. All the bad talk you hear about the humanities in universities, there's been this huge end run of innovation on the internet. Yeah. And it's amazing. Look, you have this thing, the Media Lab. I'm sure you know yes. about it done some excellent things, done a lot of very bogus things, but you're out competing them. You're blowing them out of the water. Yeah. Like you are them. The internet will outrace them for a long time, maybe forever. Well, I mean, but it's okay if they're, as long as they're keeping. Yeah. And we're both in universities. So we have multiple hats on here yeah. as we're speaking. So yes. we can complain about the university, <laughs> but that's like complaining about the podcast, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We be them. <laughs> the data from the Navy to me seem quite serious. Mm -hmm. I don't pretend that I have the technical abilities to judge it as data. But there are numerous senators at the very highest of levels, former heads of CIA, Brennan. I talked to him, did an interview with him. I asked him, what's up with these? <laughs> what do you think it is? He basically said that was the single most likely explanation yeah. was of alien origin. Now, you don't have to agree with him, 
But look, if you know how government works, these senators, or Hillary Clinton for that matter, or Brennan, they sat down, they were briefed by their smartest people, and they said, hey, what's going on here? And everyone around the table, I believe, is telling them, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And that is sociological data I take very seriously. I have not seen a debunking of the technical data. Yes. Which is eyewitness reports and images and radar. Again, at a technical level, I, I feel quite uncertain on that turf. But evaluating sort of the testimony of witnesses, it seems to me it's now at a threshold where one ought to take it seriously. Yes. Even if it has nothing to do with aliens, yeah. whatever the answer is, it has to be something fascinating. Yeah. We already know everything's interesting, but this is fascinating. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but look, that all said, I, I suspect they're not of alien origin. And let's yeah. let me tell you my reason. The people who are all gung-ho, they do a kind of reasoning in reverse or argument from elimination. They figure out a bunch of things that can't be. Like, is it a Russian advanced vehicle? Mm -hmm. No, probably pretty good arguments there. Is it a Chinese advanced vehicle? No. Is it people like from the Earth's future coming back in time? No. And they go through a few others. They have some really good no arguments. Then they're like, well, what we've got left is aliens. Yeah. This argument from elimination, I don't actually find that persuasive. You can talk yourself into a lot of mistaken ideas that way. Yeah. The positive evidence that it's aliens is still quite weak. The positive evidence that it's a puzzle is quite huge. And the, and the, whatever the solution to the puzzle is, it might be fascinating. And that, it's going to be so weird or fascinating or maybe even trivial, but that's weird in its own way, that we can't set up by elimination all the things it might be able to be. Yeah. And Avi, as you mentioned to him on your podcast with him, he's been attacked an awful lot. Mm -hmm. And when I hear the idea carrier attacked, I get very suspicious of the critics. Uh, yeah. if, if he's wrong, like, just tell me why. Yeah. Like, my ears are open. I don't have a set view on Oumuamua, you know. I, I know I can't judge Avi's arguments. He can't convince me in that sense. I'm too stupid <laughs> to yeah. understand how good his argument may or may not be. This is my view on that. If we declassified everything... I think we would find a lot more evidence all pointing toward the same puzzle. There aren't some alien men being held underground. Yes. There's not some secret file that lays out whatever is happening. I think the real lesson about government is government cannot bring itself to any new belief on this matter mm -hmm. of any kind. And it's a kind of funny inertia. Like government is deeply puzzled. They're more puzzled than they want to admit to us, which like, I, I'm okay with that actually. They shouldn't just be out panicking people in the streets. But at the end of the day, it's a bit like approving the AstraZeneca vaccine, yeah. like which does work and they haven't approved it. Like, when are they going to do it? Like, when is our government actually, if only internally, going to take this more than just seriously, but like take it truly seriously? Yeah. And I just don't know if we have that capability kind of mentally to sound like Eric Weinstein for a, another <laughs> moment. <laughs> Well, most of us don't really long to create art, right? I would start with that point. You think so? You think that's to create a, art? I don't. That's think... unique weirdness of a, some particular humans. I think I don't know ten percent of humans, roughly, which is a lot, but it is somewhat weird. Yeah, uh, I don't aspire to create art. You could say, like writing nonfiction. There's something art-like about it, but it's a different urge. I yeah. would say. Yeah. Uh, so why do some people have it? I think human brains are very different. It's a different notion of working through a problem. Like you and I enjoy working through analytic problems. Mm -hmm. For me, economics, for you, AI in other areas, or your humanities podcast. <laughs> but that's fun. Yeah. For that problem to be visual <laughs> and linked to physical materials and putting those like on a canvas, to me, it's not a huge leap. But I really don't want to do it. Like it would be pain. If you paid me like 500 bucks to spend an hour painting, I don't know. Uh, is that worth it? Maybe. But like I'm happy when that hour's over. <laughs> <laughs> and would not be proud or happy with the result. It would suck. 
I don't think I would do it actually. I, I, do you think you're suppressing some deep? I mean, the, the... absolutely not. Now, <laughs> when I was young, I played the guitar as you played the guitar, yeah. and that I greatly enjoyed. Although I was never good, but it helped me appreciate music much, much more. It's clearly a concept of bad. And my guitar <laughs> playing fit that concept. <laughs> okay. But I wasn't trying to be good. I wanted to learn like how do chords work? Okay. And how does a jazz improvisation work? How is right. blues different? Classical guitar, sort of physically, how do you make those sounds? Yes. And I did learn those things. And you can you can't learn everything about them, but you can learn a lot about them without ever being good mm. or even trying to be that good. But I could play all the notes. Oh. Not an absurd question at all. And I think about this quite a bit. I would say the two winners by a clear margin are both by oh. Michelangelo. It's the Pieta in the Vatican mm -hmm. and the David statue in Florence. Why? Historical context or just purity of the, 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 the creation itself? I don't think you can view it apart from historical context. And being in Florence or in the Vatican, is it's, you're already primed okay. for a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. You can't pull that out. But just technically how they express you, the emotion of human form, I do honestly, intellectually think they're the two greatest artworks for doing that. That's not all that art does. Not all art is about the human form, but they are phenomenal. And I think critical opinion, not that everyone agrees, but my view is not considered a crazy one within the broader court of critical opinion. Now, in painting, I think the most I was ever blown away was to see Vermeer's artwork. It's called The Art of Painting, mm. and it's in Vienna in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. And I saw that, I think I was 23. Uh, it just stunned me because I'd seen reproductions, but live in front of you in huge, a completely different artwork. And again, Vienna primed. Yes. <laughs> and I was living abroad for the first time in Vienna itself, the city and so on. Now, unlike the Michelangelo's, that is not my current favorite painting, uh, but that would be like historically the one I would pick. I think not a lot of it is phenomenal. And I would say the single biggest mistake that really smart people make is to think contemporary art or music for that matter is just a load of junk or rubbish. Mm -hmm. It's just like a kind of mathematics they haven't learned yet. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to learn. Maybe some people can never learn it, uh, but there's a very large community of super smart, well-educated people who spend their lives with it, who love it. Those are genuine pleasures. They understand it. They talk about it with the common language. And to think that somehow they're all frauds, it just isn't true. Like one doesn't have to like it oneself just like yes. Clubhouse may or may not be your thing, but it is amazing and for me personally, highly rewarding. And if someone doesn't get it, I do kind of have the conceited response of thinking like in that area, I'm just smarter than you are. Yeah, so the the interesting thing is, as with most- We get back to Eric Weinstein again. Right? Yes. Who is <laughs> in general smarter than I am, this I get. But when it comes to contemporary artistic creations, I'm smarter than he is. So he's not a fan of contemporary art? I don't want to speak for him. I've heard him he's say derogatory. He's evolving always. <laughs> he's evolving always. I've heard him say derogatory things about some of it. Doesn't mean he doesn't love some other parts of it. I think that's true for many people, but I think it's a funny shaped distribution because there's a whole other set of people, sometimes just small children, and they get abstract art more easily. Yeah. You show them Vermeer or Rembrandt, they don't get it. Yeah. But just like a a wall of color. Yeah. They're yeah. in love with it. So yeah. yeah. I don't think I know the full story. Again, some strange kind of distribution. The entry yeah. barriers are super high or super low. But not that often in between. Yeah, it's one of the most profound bodies of human thought out there. And it's part of the humanities. And yes, there are people who also don't like podcasts, right? <laughs> and that's fine. Yeah. Well, we have to travel because yeah. my preferred last meal here, I probably had like two nights ago. <laughs> Which is what? <clears throat> Can you describe or no? The best restaurant around here is called Mama Chang's mm -hmm. and it's in Fairfax and it's food uh, from Wuhan, actually. Huh. And uh, they take pandemic safety seriously in addition to the food being very good. 
but this is what I would do. I would fly to Hermosillo in northern Mexico, which has some of the best food in Mexico, but I sadly only had two days there. Mm -hmm. So somewhere like Oaxaca, Puebla, I think ha they have food just as good, or some people would say better, but I've spent a lot of time in those places. So the scarce, wait, is it possible the scarcity of time contributed to the, the richness of the experience? Of course, but the point is that scarcity still holds. Yeah. So I want one more yes. dose yes. of the food from Hermosillo. Can we describe what the food is? It's the one kind of Mexican food that at least nominally is just like the Mexican food you get in the U.S. So there are burritos, there's fajitas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't taste at all like our stuff. But again, nominally, it's the part of Mexican food that made it into the U.S., was then transformed. Yes. But it's in a way the most familiar. But for that reason, it's the most radical because you have to rethink all these things you know. And they're way better in Hermosillo. Hardly any tourists go there. Like there's nothing to see in Hermosillo. Yes. Nothing to do other than eat. It's not ruined by any outsiders. It's this long-standing tradition. Uh, dirt cheap. And the thing to do there is just sweet talk a taxi driver into first taking you seriously and then trusting you enough to know that you trust him to bring you to the very best, like food stands. Well, you can break the food down part by part. So if you think of the beef, the beef there will be dry aged, just out in the air. In a way, the FDA here would never permit. Like yeah. they dry age it till it turns green, but it is yeah. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, the quality of the chilies. So here, there's only a small number of kinds of chilies you can get. In most parts of Mexico, there's quite a large number of chilies you can get. They're different, they're fresher, but it's just like a different thing, the chilies. Uh, the wheat used, so this is wheat territory, not corn territory, which is itself interesting. Uh, the wheat is more diverse and more complex. Here it's more homogenized, obviously cheaper, more efficient, but there it is better. Uh, Non-pasteurized cheeses are legal mm -hmm. in all parts of Mexico, and they can be white and gooey and amazing in a way that here, again, it's just against the law. Mm -hmm. You could legalize them. The demand wouldn't be that great. There's a black market in these cheeses at Latino groceries around here, but you just can't get that much of it. Mm -hmm. So the cheese, the meat, the wheat, uh, all different in significant ways. The chilies, uh, I don't think the onions really matter much. Garlic, I don't know. I wouldn't put much stock in that. But that's a lot of the core food, and then it's cooked much better, and everything's super fresh. The food chain is not relying on refrigeration, and this is one thing Russia and U.S. have in common. We were early pioneers in food refrigeration, and that made a lot of our foods worse quite early. Mm. And it took us a long time to dig out of that. Because big countries, right? Is there you, you've had an extensive rail system in Russia, USSR, yes. a long time, which makes it easier to freeze and then ship. And there's no brain drain out of cooking. So if you're <laughs> in the United States and you're very talented, yeah. I'm not saying there aren't talented chefs. Of course there are. But there's so many other things to pull people away. Yeah. But in Mexico, there's so much talent going into food, as there is in China, which would be another candidate for last meal questions, <laughs> or India. <laughs> Sushi is about perfection, but it's a bit like the Beatles' White Album, which people think is simple and not overproduced. Yeah. It's in a funny way, their most overproduced album, but it's produced just perfectly. It sounds simple. It's really hard to produce music to the point where it's going to sound so simple and not sound like sludge. Like Let It Be album. It has some great songs, but a lot of it sounds like sludge. One after 909, that's sludge. I dig a pony, it's sludge. Like it's a bit interesting. It's not that good. It doesn't sound that good. White album, like the best half, like Dear Prudence. Sounds perfect. Sounds simple. Cry, baby, cry. It's not simple. Back in the USSR. Super yeah. complex. So sushi's like that. It's because it's so incredibly not simple, starting with the rice. You try to refine it to make it appear super simple, and that's the most complex thing of all. I'm happy they do it, but I actually feel bad about it. I feel they're sacrificial victims to me, which I benefit from. But don't you ever think like, gee, you're a great master sushi, sushi chef. Wouldn't you be happier if you did something else? Uh, yeah. 
doesn't seem to happen. That might and be something that a weird mind. Maybe would it think. is weird people, and yeah. maybe they're really enjoying it. But like to learn how to pack rice for ten years before they let you do anything else. It's like these Indian, you know, sarod players. They just spend five years tapping out rhythms before they're allowed to touch their instruments. <laughs> I tend to think it's like artists that some percent of people are like that, but most are not. And for most of us, there's no free lunch. Like my free lunch is to move around a lot in search of lunch. Well, two of them we've already discussed. One is Plato's Dialogues, which mm. I started reading when I was like 13. Another is Ayn Rand, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. But I would say, uh, the Friedrich Hayek essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society, mm -hmm. which is about how decentralized mechanisms can work, also why they might go wrong. And that's where you start to understand the price system, capitalism. And that was in a book called Individualism and Economic Order, but it was just a few essays in that book. Those are maybe the three I would cite. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the... Say the price of copper goes up, right? Because there's a, a problem with a copper mine in Chile or Bolivia. So the price of copper goes up all around the world. People are led to economize copper, to look for substitutes for copper, to change their production processes, to change the goods and services they buy, to build homes a different way. And this one event creates this one tiny change in information. This gets into your AI work very directly. And how much complexity that one change engenders in a meaningful, coherent way, how the different pieces of the price system fit together. Hayek really laid out very clearly, and it's a, it's like an AI problem, and how well, not for everything, but for many things, we solve that AI problem. I learned, I was, I think, 13, maybe 14 when I read Hayek. Yeah, the distributed nature of things there. And it's like your work on human attention, like how much can we take in? Yes. Very often, not that much. And how many of the advances of modern civilization you need to understand as a response to that constraint? I got that also from Hayek. And what's the title of the book again? Uh, it's reprinted in a lot of books at this point. But back then, the book was called Individualism and Economic Order. Mm -hmm. But the essay is online. Hayek, Use of Knowledge in Society. There are open access versions of it through Google. And you don't need the whole book. No, it's a very good book. Most good advice is context specific, but here are my two generic pieces of advice. Good. First, get a mentor, both career, but anything you want to learn. Like say you want to learn about contemporary art. People write me this. Oh, what book should I read? It's, it's probably not going to work that way. You need a mentor. Yes, you should read some books on it, but you want a mentor to help you frame them, take you around to some art, talk about it with you. So mm -hmm. get as many mentors as you can in the things you want to learn. And then I can I ask you a quick yeah. uh, uh, tangent on that? Uh, presumably a good mentor. Of course. Uh, is and there I'm begging the question in there? It's complicated, right? Yeah, well, it is complicated. Is there a lot of damage to be done from a bad mentor? I don't think that much because it's very easy to drop mentors. And in fact, it's quite hard to maintain them. Good mentors tend to be busy. Yeah. Bad mentors tend to be busy. Yeah. Uh, and you can try on mentors and maybe they're not good for you, but you still, there's a good chance you'll learn something. Like I had a mentor, I was an undergrad, he was a Stalinist. He edited the book called The Essential Stalin, brilliant guy. I learned a tremendous amount from him. Mm -hmm. Was he like as a Stalinist, a good mentor for me, fan of Hayek? Well, no, but for a year it was tremendous. Hmm, yeah. He introduced me like to, you know, Soviet and Eastern European science fiction because he was a Marxist. Like that's what I took from him, among other things. Interesting, be direct and try. <laughs> it's not like a perfect formula, but it's amazing how many people don't even try. do those things. Be interesting, be direct and try. Like what you want from a better known person, I would just say be very direct with them. Yeah. Beautiful. What's the second piece of advice? Build small groups of peers. They don't have to be your age, but very often they'll be your age, especially if you're younger, with broadly similar interests, but there can be different points of view. People you hang out with, which can include in a WhatsApp group online, and like every day or almost every day, they're talking about the thing you care about, trying to solve problems in that thing. 
and that's your small group and you really like them and they like you and you care what you think about each other and you have this common interest. That's for human connection or is that for development of ideas? It's both. They're not that different. <laughs> like Beatles, classic small group, right? Uh, but there's so much drama. The Florentine artists, of course there's drama and small groups tend to split up, which is fine, just like entering relationships often end. But it's remarkable how little has been done that was not done in small groups in some way. There are multiple layers of understanding that question. So kind of the lowest layer is the Darwinian answer, hmm. right? If we weren't this way, we wouldn't have been successful in reproducing and building alliances. It's important to realize that's far from complete. Sort of the highest understanding would be poetic, like read John Keats or uh, you know, many other love poets. Is that... Well, first, it's all interesting, but more it's concretely, awesome. my wife was born in Moscow. Sokolniki was her oh, neighborhood. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And she okay. grew up there. I married her here. Uh, my daughter, I adopted her. I'm not her biological father, but I genuinely raised her. Mm -hmm. She was born in Russia, though she came here when she was one. Wow. Uh, my father- So you're basically Russian. No, no, no. I'm a New Jersey boy. Uh, That's the same thing. I'm very sorry to report my father-in-law passed away a week Sorry. ago. He lived with us for six years. He lived in Russia till he was, oh, 70. Saw, you know, the Stalinist terror. His father was brought to a camp, lived through World War II, much, much more. Uh, had an incredible life. Never really learned how to speak English. So I absorbed something Russian from him as well. He was part Armenian. Uh, so that's my connection to Russia. A bit of the Russian soul too. Do you, do you? I don't think I have it. I think I appreciate it. But there's division of labor, right? Others in the family. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of that. I'm I'm more superficial. You mentioned Keats and uh, that higher version, that non-Darwinian love. What's that about? That it's the highest form of human connection and it's intoxicating and it's part of building a life. And most of us are very, very strongly drawn to it. And it's part of the highest realization of you being what you can be. Yeah. You mentioned you lost- But ask a Russian. I mean, this is a <laughs> superficial New Jersey boy who grew up listening to Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and that Springsteen. was his romanticism. What's, what, what's, <laughs> uh, what's your favorite Bruce uh, Springsteen song? I think the album Born to Run has actually held up the best. Though it's very fashionable to think the earlier or later works are actually better, and that's the overproduced super pop album. But the quality of the songs, to me, Born to Run is just far and away the best, then Darkness on the Edge of Town. Yeah. And those are still my favorites. That... Born to Run is an incredible song. Yeah. And perfectly produced in a Phil Spector kind of way. Every detail is right, every what lyric. Else? It's a very good song, Dancing in the Dark. Yeah. A lot of the later work, I find the percussion becomes too simple and kind of too white somehow mm. and a little clunky. And it's still good work. He's super talented, but it doesn't speak to me. Do you, but when it all bursts open into the open road, like it does on Born to Run, that's yeah. magic. Yeah. I'd or love, Rosalita. Have you ever seen him live? Do. Is it? Yes, twice. I wonder what he's like live when he was young, right? That Those years. I saw him live when he was young. I was young. Uh, New Jersey. I was a little disappointed, actually. Yeah? I think what I like best from him is quite studio. He certainly played well. I don't fault his performance. But it's like when I saw Plant and Page, you know, of Led Zeppelin. Tremendous creators. And they showed up. They were not drunk. Like, they were paying mm -hmm. attention. But I was underwhelmed because Led Zeppelin like the Beatles' White Album, is much more of a studio band than you think at yeah. first. Of course, a it, thickness to culture in that yeah. part of the world, yeah. which is oddly similar to some elements of the thickness of Russian culture. Yeah. And when you see like Russian characters on The Sopranos, yeah. <laughs> it totally makes sense, even yeah. though they're these complete outliers. Yeah. I don't think about my own mortality that much, which is probably a good thing. I think death will be bad. I wouldn't say I'm afraid of it. For me, the worst thing about death is not knowing how the human story turns out. 
The full human story. The full human not... story. So if I could, right before I die, read like a Wikipedia page called The Rest of Human History and have enough time, just like a few days to absorb it, think about it, and know like, oh, well, 643 years from now, that's when all the atomic weapons went off. And here's what happened between now and then. Hmm. I would feel much better dying. <laughs> But that's it, not how it's it, going to be, right? It's, that's it's, unlikely. Probably too. true. Yeah. But it's the only one I can read and understand, right? <laughs> and it may be hard to understand the human one past a number of centuries. Yeah, because with of technology. AI, yes. yes. Uh, like how many years from now will reading Wikipedia be like trying to read Chaucer? <laughs> which I almost can do, but I actually can't. I need a translation. <laughs> Probably yeah. you can't do it at all. Yeah. I hope not. Because <laughs> that section we could write now, and it's just not going to be very good, right? Is, what, what would you put in the section on the meaning of uh, human existence? I don't know. Links to a lot of other sections. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there are general statements about the meaning of life that have that much meaning. <laughs> I think if you study different cultures, the arts, travel, mathematics, like whatever your thing is, yeah. you'll get a lot about the meaning of life. So like it's there in Wikipedia in some bigger sense. Yeah. But I don't want to read the page on the meaning. I bet they have such a page, in fact. The fact that I've never visited it, none of my friends, oh, here, Tyler, here's the page on the meaning of life. I know you've been wondering about this. you got to read this one. No yeah. one's ever done that to you, have they? This is the Lex Free Podcast.